Good morning. Uh, it, this, to me, is one of those fascinating topics that, despite everybody knowing exactly what a compartment syndrome is and everybody knowing how to treat it, we still see complications of compartment syndrome on a regular basis in pediatrics. Okay? So I'd like to talk a little bit about why I think so, and I think some of it is because we tend to think, and, and, and I know pediatric people like Scott and I do this every time, but they're not little adults, but the concepts are important. That's a, that's an, it's an anatomically, it might even anatomically be a different disease, but it certainly physiologically is a different disease in children versus adults, okay? Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about these. So we'll talk about definitions, etiologies, certainly how the diagnosis is different, and then why the treatment, despite the textbooks looking like the same operation, have very different outcomes in children versus adults. So, you know, th th this is, uh, you know, the old trope about, we all know what this is, right? You learn this. This is one of the first things I think you learn in, in medical school when you're doing an ED rotation or something. You know, conceptually, that it's elevated pressure within a closed myofascial space, the calf, the forearm, the thigh, they all have closed myofascial spaces. And, and, and to put it very simply, the muscles get engorged, the, there's a, a capillary reflow, a flow that's lost, and basically you can go from the, the, the muscles and the uh, tissues that are most sensitive to ischemia to the ones that are least sensitive, and, and you can figure out what's gonna happen over time. It's, it's very st relatively straightforward. And we have numbers, and everybody loves memorizing the numbers, and uh, you know, you, you, we've gotta have something to hang our hats on for the diagnosis, as you know. And I think, and I'm gonna argue, it might have hurt us a little bit in changing our views on this diagnosis in children. Because we so wanna hang our hat on a number, and yet, as you, and everybody who's ever tried to stick a two-year-old's forearm, for example, you're not getting a reasonable number. So all of a sudden, all these things that we ultimately used to make this diagnosis aren't that useful for us in kids. And then there is this thing that's become a little more obvious as time has gone on that kids probably have higher resting pressures. They probably can tolerate a little more pressure over time than, than adults can. So it, it, it's, and, it, and that may be why the disease looks different over time, and I'll show you what I mean by that in the outcomes part. And Scott, you know, we, we see this, I, thank God I don't see this much, but we still see one of these once a year, it walks into a general clinic, and Scott probably sees three or four a year, I'm sure, around, the, around uh, uh, tertiary practice. This is a disaster, and it's a disaster for many reasons, um, uh, the least of which is, you know, the, the uh, medical legal part of this, okay? Um, so I, I really feel like every time some symposium like this is given, this topic should be covered. I'm just gonna, one of my soapboxes about it. So what, what are the etiologies? So in kids, it's still the same as you guys. Adults get trauma, kids get trauma, the vascular injury part of this. We see constrictive cast issues. We do have a couple things, the neonate with the IV infiltrate, for example. We see these little babies or even these, these little guys in septic shock or with pyomyositis. We don't have the, the, the venomous bite issues that some of the southwestern uh, places do, but we have a little bit of different shift in, in what our etiologies are. And then I, I, I think one thing that probably needs to always be tested on every single OIT or board is this idea that, yes, we all understand that trauma is an etiology for compartment syndrome, but these are three things that still create compartment syndrome that aren't necessarily the ones that are gonna jump out at you. So the forearm, and uh, Scott talked a little bit about it, but actually one of the most common places that we see compartment syndrome in children are kids that had IM nail fixation, okay? So it, it's, a, it's a real issue that comes up. It's not just an injury-related thing, it's an, it's, a, it's an iatrogenic thing. The middle one is one that's curious because I, I, different places manage it, but that is just a tibial tubercle avulsion fracture. It's from uh, eccentric quad contraction. We see it probably 15 times a year, okay? But there's a little vessel right in the anterior compartment that can get popped off and they can leak blood into their anterior compartment. And actually, that's a fairly common etiology of compartment syndrome in children. And then finally, this one on the right is something that sort of uh, is, a, is a whole paradigm shift in how we treat femur fractures, a talk for a different day. But it turns out, in the, if you look at literature through the 80s and the early 90s, we were taught to put a short leg cast onto the, the, the calf, pull traction with the hip at 90 degrees, the knee at 90 degrees, and then wrap the spica cast, okay? And then all of a sudden, people were like, well, how come we're getting compartment syndrome and we're getting it in the calf when they have a thigh injury, 
Okay? So this is one that we've sort of, I think we've solved that one by teaching a different spike of cast methodology. But it's something that's out there that I think we didn't appreciate. So this is the classics. So these are high energy injuries for the most part. 40% of traumatic pediatric compartment syndromes are still from tibial shaft fractures. Okay? 40%. And this is the high risk group, the adolescents, the comminuted shafts, and the kids that present with a neurologic deficit when they come in. Open fractures in some series are also part of that, but they are ob obviously they all run together. But if you look, we also see them in forearms, supracondylar fractures. Now, the, the, the isolated supracondylar is actually a fairly low percentage of our compartment syndromes. However, and Scott alluded to this, and every pediatric orthopedist who gives this talk will say the same thing. A distal humeral shaft, a distal supracondylar fracture that's displaced, and a distal both bones or a mid shaft both bones forearm fracture is a so called compartment syndrome machine. Okay? It turns out to have the highest incidence. Now, not all the studies, if you use the word floating elbow, for example, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get compartment syndrome because some people call distal radius metaphyseal fractures that. But both bones forearm and supracondylar fractures are really a high energy risk. And then, of course, I still see the, cr the crush injuries that, that you guys do, but not quite as commonly as you think. Um, I, I think I've done maybe one true foot compartment syndrome in 21 years of practice at St. Chris. So classic teaching. So let's go back a little bit. So we all, again, learn these two concepts, right? You check the P's, and then you stick the compartment. It's sort of a classic way to go about addressing the diagnosis of compartment syndrome in anybody, really, assuming they're awake and alert and they can be examined, OK? But you go to the, the pediatric side of this, and all of a sudden, the P's, for example, aren't so easy to, to distinguish. And, I, and, I, and I, 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 must have given, I must give this talk 10 times a year about, about this idea. I showed up as a new attending at a pediatric center, having been a fellow for the year. But before that, I was basically trained in an adult hospital system. And I didn't really appreciate that I didn't know how to examine a three-year-old or a four-year-old with a com potential compartment syndrome who was screaming and crying and unhappy. Okay. So we have to learn, we have to appreciate that the, the differential, the, the uh, clinical assessment of these guys is, is variable. And uh, you know, nerve injuries, for example, are very hard to diagnose specifically under about three or four years of age, as are uh, pain. You can go through the P's if you really think about it. Pain with passive stretch. So you can walk into a three-year-old's room with a supracondylar, and you look at them, and they start to cry. So when you touch their fingers, does that count as pain with passive stretch? I, I don't really know. So it, it changed a little bit about how we thought, but this kind of solidified this concept that Scott alluded to about changing your thought about compartment syndrome and how to diagnose it. I love this paper because of, of what it, not because it's, it's the huge series or something, but they had something that had not been looked at or published prior. This is 23 patients admitted to a children's hospital, and it's old paper now, but 10 of them developed the compartment syndrome while they were in the hospital. In other words, they came in with rule out compartment syndrome. And in their hospital course, they were diagnosed with compartment syndrome and then went on to have fasciotomies. Okay? And basically what they said was, you can look at a couple things. And, and really, the, the bottom line was this. So this one in particular. See this here? So what these guys did was, they said, let's look at everything we can find. And they looked at all the P's. And the P's turned out to be difficult to separate because you can't reliably make the P's diagnoses, right? But what they did find was that about 10 hours before the compartment syndrome was officially, officially diagnosed, they started to need more pain medicine, okay? And you're going to say, well, what do you mean? Well, what it means is the nurses called the resident or whoever and said, this kid's having more pain. Can you give him something? Something as very simple as that phone call at night can be a, a sort of a warning sign that there's something more going on here. And what they traced was really, and I do this, I will literally go to the nursing record, find out what the pain management system was overnight, and if it looks like this kid has been asking for more and more pain medicine, I don't even use the, you know, the goofy 10-point uh, scales and all that. I don't even care about those. You, you, this is a more objective way to look at it, okay? Um, so I look at the, that part, but the, the other part. So this is, this is where I really want you to focus. So the anxiety agitation thing is, I know it sounds vague, but what it means is this is a clinical diagnosis in the end, OK? You're going to walk into this room. And, I, and actually, I make this point also. I can diagnose this actually in the hallway, looking in the room without the kid knowing I'm looking at them, because they're really uncomfortable in a different way than a kid who just has pain from a broken arm, OK? So, the state-of-the-art thinking on compartment syndrome is this concept that it's not 
a numbers game, okay? It's not a three, a three out of the six Ps are abnormal game. It is a, let me look at the kid, and does the child look uncomfortable to a point where they cannot get relief? Are they so agitated that mom, child life, video games can't change their demeanor, okay? But really, have they shown that they need more and more medicine to feel better? So very important sort of paradigm shift in your brain if you're going to take care of these kids. And then, of course, honestly, I stopped sticking kids, awake and alert kids anymore um, as a diagnostic tool, okay? I sometimes, when I go to the OR to do the fasciotomy, will document, but even that I stopped doing it because I still think it's a clinical diagnosis. I want to keep hammering that home, okay? We, Scott and I will talk in our cases, I hope, about the, the obtunded kid and what to do, but the, this is the awake and alert kit. Treatment. So the treatment's the same for us. You know, and another thing about uh, pediatrics that, that I, I, I was at somewhere last year, and somebody said, I just hate making incisions on these poor kids if, they, if I'm not sure they have a, a compartment syndrome. And I said to them, you've got to be kidding me, right? You're going to literally worry about the length of your incision and risk the, the loss of the limb or loss of the anterior compartment. So think about this as salvaging this limb, and you'll deal with the cosmesis later. Okay, I, I really, I mean, you can try to cheat short and all that, but I really think you got to get them decompressed. And I was taught, and I, I don't know how you guys are being taught, but it, you should literally go look at every muscle that you're worried about and make sure it's decompressed. You got to go look at them. Okay, so if you can't see it or you can't tell, make the incision bigger. Okay, and in the forearm, for example, we, I, you know, that's, I think these are actually Scott slides probably because I have a lot of Scott slides, but I, you need to go, especially if it's a supracondylar one, you got to go into the proximal arm. You got to go across the Lacertus, you got to go all the way down the forearm, and you got to go all the way down to the carpal tunnel. I think it's legitimately got to be done as, as if this child's going to lose their arm, not, oh, I'm just, just a prophylactic going to do it, okay? Wound management. So this is one thing you can save a little skin and a little, little cosmesis on. So we have evolved away from uh, packing them open, which we did when I first started, to the Jacob's Ladder technique, to VAX, okay? And, I, and I do, we do use VAC management Post-op, we, we will, I tend to do one second look to see if I can maybe close one wound or, or get closure, change the vac. As you know, in two-year-olds and five-year-olds, vac bedside changes aren't nearly as easy as they are if you're older, okay? So we tend to go more to the OR, but in the end, my goal has usually been to try to avoid skin grafts if I can, and if I can't, we'll do it to standard as you close one, close the other one partially, and have them drop a graft, okay? And, and uh, we have been pretty successful with skin scar management just by paying attention to the post-op care. So outcomes. This is, th this is where I think you also need to hear this if you're an adult person dealing with an uh, adult person. We're all, I hate that we always say adult orthopedists, but we're all adults who are treating children and kids. So what, what I want you to understand is this. This is uh, an upper extremity. So CHOP had done a huge database search and teased out upper extremity, lower extremity, and very young child's compartment syndrome outcomes. Okay, that's what these papers are, effectively. 74% of kids with upper extremity compartment syndromes do well, okay? And the, the, the kids who show up with pre-existing nerve injuries that don't recover are the ones actually that drop out of this one, okay? But look at the time to fasciotomy. Average time to fasciotomy is 32 hours, okay? So A, we do delay our diagnoses even at a place like CHOP, okay? But B, don't say, oh, it's too late. I, I, I must have missed the boat. These kids, if you, if you eventually evolve to their diagnoses and you think they can be saved, they should be fasciotomized, okay? So that's, that's the first point. And the upper extremity are definitely difficult, more difficult than this group. And this is, a, this is actually a combined paper, if you look. It's from Hopkins and from, from uh, Flynn and the guys at CHOP. 95% excellent outcomes, okay? So we, this is why I think this is a different this entity. Even with 20 hours or later of fasciotomy time, they still did well. So the kids are somehow different, protected from major ischemia, I think, than, than adults are, okay? And I don't know why. It might be microvascular structures different. They don't smoke, all the, all the pre-existing factors. It might be a little more elasticity in the compartment, and, and the expansion goes over a slower period of time. I'm not actually sure, but this is a consistent finding. So I always say this again. If you're not sure, you can wait a little bit, but don't wait too long, and then always open if you, if you can't decide, okay? And this is the last group. And this is, I, I, brought, I brought this slide up for a couple of reasons, but look at the etiologies in the very young kids. I think they defined it under two, okay? So we see infection. Now, this is a new concept, and I, I, I don't know if I've, um, 
I know I've given uh, talks about this at Temple, but when, when the advent of community-acquired MRSA hit us, okay, we all of a sudden were seeing these kids with massively swollen arms and legs and looking like compartment syndromes. And when we released them, they acted like a compartment syndrome. So we are seeing that. And 27% of those little guys turn out to have infections. And then anybody who works in a, in a busy hospital that has NICUs always sees IV infiltrates. It's a big problem. Okay? But the etiologies are different. They do respond actually fairly well, though. And I think I have that data there. But they do pretty well, again, if you get to them, no matter what their etiology is. So I think what I'm trying to say is make the diagnosis and treat it. If, you, if you're wrong, it's probably not going to be that often. And if you're correct, you hit a home run. Okay? So uh, summary, not the same as you know, all the same tropes. Uh, treatment is fasciotomy, but this last line is really key. Try to get used to making this diagnosis and just taking it by the, the, the horns and, and making the, the treatment plan for it. Um, I, these are my cases, Dr. DeLong. Should we?